we have, but um, he's an amazing person. Uh, the, the Professor Philip Marsh is a microbiologist based in the UK who's been involved with oral microbiology for most of his career. And one of the things he said to me is, at times he was wondering, you know, what's it all for? Until he came here and he started realizing that we're looking for practical applications for everything that he's spent his entire life doing. He has developed novel, novel ideas on how dental plaque exists with the host in health and disease. This research has resulted in numerous awards. In 1991, Professor Marsh received the Orca Research in Dental Caries. In 98, the IADR, the International Association for Dental Research, Distinguished Scientist Award. And recently, in 2001, the Society for General Microbi Microbiology, which is based in the UK, for applied research. So without keeping you any further, uh, I present to you Professor Philip Marsh. Thank you very much for all these uh, warm words. Um, in fact, I've never been so nervous in all my life before at all because I've had so many complimentary comments. And it's absolutely true um, in that I'm a microbiologist, so the one thing that frightens me, there's no mention of patients in this. This is looking at dental plaque and trying to understand how it has this complex relationship with each one of us in health and disease because plaque as you will see in my slide, is natural. We all have it. You'll never get rid of it. And in fact, it does us good. You can't live without organisms in your body. At the same time, it keeps you all in a job because it can do mischief, it can do disease. And it's understanding that relationship because dental diseases are different to many of the medical uh, diseases um, that you'll hear colleagues talk about. So I spend some of my time now working on tuberculosis. In general, you have to catch the organism from someone else. Uh, it gets in the lung, it shouldn't be there, and it causes disease, and you can treat it with a vaccine or uh, antibiotics. In one level, well, it's a very difficult disease to treat, but at one level, it's very simple to understand. It's an overt pathogen. What we're talking about with dental diseases is something that's much more complex and much more complicated to understand. And in my lecture, I'm gonna try and explain how I feel I came up with a much simpler way of understanding the relationship between these bacteria that we all have and we should cherish and why we get disease in some people and other people stay healthy and how you can exploit that knowledge to try and keep people healthy while maintaining the benefits of these organisms. So first of all, uh, just to let you know where I come from. There's a small island off mainland Euro Europe called the United Kingdom. And I have a sort of more complex lifestyle in that I uh, work in two places. So most of my time is spent at something that's newly set up in the UK called the Health Protection Agency, which is supposed to look at uh, microbiological, uh, radiological and chemical natural or deliberate threats. So we have... Um, laboratories all over the country that can look after the most nasty organisms uh, that exist. And I've done oral microbiology there, and I'm now doing tuberculosis research there. And then I travel once a month via London up on the train to Leeds, which is in the north of England, where um, I have uh, my professorship and I teach and do research in oral microbiology. So this is Salisbury, where the nearest city to where I'm based down in the south of England. It's a medieval city. It's a little bit older than Chicago, and it's famous for the cathedral, which has the tallest spire in England at 404 feet high. And it was built in 1230, in about 30 years, which is quicker than some of the builders I have for my house. <laughs> and nearby is an even older structure. About 10 miles away, we have Stonehenge, which is where we learn to play soccer these ancient goalposts. Uh, when I go to Leeds, Leeds is an industrial, northern industrial city, but it's been uh, fortunate in retaining a lot of its Victorian architecture. So these are some covered markets, and this is the university, or part of the university, that's up the top of the hill there. And I should acknowledge at this point that the work I'm going to describe that's led me to come to some of these ideas and hypotheses is really uh, 
due to the um, brilliant work of some of my colleagues. So, I need to pose you some questions. I need to engage. And I would say that um, so far I've paid all my own travel. I'm hoping to get it back. <laughs> but I notice there are score sheets in the um, pack. So unless you give me a decent score, I may not get all of this back. So um, one thing was engaging the audience. So this you can tick this box now. Um, so does dental plaque play an important role in your professional life? No? Yes. Don't hear anything? Yes. Yes. yes? Well, we can help. Microbiologists know a lot about dental plaque. There are lots of bacterial types. We've found them all. We've given them complicated names for you to impress your patients. We like to change these names fairly often so you don't understand it. And we'll even offer you bug of the month um, to help. Is this interesting to you or helpful to your patients? No. What I'm proposing and trying to convince you of in this lecture is that understanding some ecological principles may help. It may simplify all of this complexity into ways that you can meaningful, tr meaningfully translate to helping to improve the dental health of your patients. So the structure of the talk is I'm going to pre briefly just review um, the relationship between all of us and our microorganisms, give you a contemporary view of dental plaque in health and disease, and use the biofilm word, describe how there is a dynamic relationship between the environment in the mouth and the body in general, and the composition of dental plaque. And that's just really understanding the basic principle. Anything that changes in the mouth will be reflected in changes in the oral flora. Explain how ecology can be applied to this, uh, cover some implications for disease control, and then summarize. But first of all, again, I've got to pose some questions to you. Uh, we have a television program, or we used to have a television program in the uh, UK where you had to spot the odd one out out of four similar looking events. So first of all, you've got a spot which is the odd one out. Is it the uh, devastation of forests due to acid rain? This is Scandinavia where all the outputs from the UK power stations gets deposited there and ruins their vegetation. Um, the overgrowth by algae on uh, lakes and streams and rivers uh, due to inorganic fertilizers, nitrogen phosphate flowing off the fields, goes into the uh, water. The algae use those uh, fertilizers. They grow up. They consume all the oxygen in the lake and kill the aquatic life there. The loss of the dinosaurs when a meteorite impacted many hundreds of millions of years ago. In fact, I was very lucky to get an early photograph here just before <laughs> the meteorite impacted, and this diplodocus is going to be in trouble, or dental disease. And my view is that they're all due to similar principles. They are all due to ecological changes that have a cause and an effect, and therefore by understanding it in ecological terms, the whole problem becomes much simpler. So starting off with the relationship between man and microbes. It's been estimated that a human being is made up of about 10 to the 14 cells, of which only 10% are mammalian. So the rest of those cells, the majority, the 90%, are actually the microbes that inhabit all of the environmentally available surfaces of the body. We all have this microflora on our skin, mouth, gut, and so on and they are of benefits to the host. It's been shown by studying germ-free animals. These are animals that are reared under abnormal conditions where they're never exposed to micro microorganisms, that the, in the absence of a normal flora, you don't get the natural development of the physiology and host defenses in those animals. So there is a direct relationship between the organisms that naturally inhabit us and our natural physiological development. It's also been shown that this uh, normal flora on any surface in, in the body is important to excluding the microorganisms we come into contact with daily. We don't inhabit a sterile environment. We come into contact with organisms in the air, in our food, water, 
and just meeting people. And in general, we don't get colonized by these organisms because of our natural flora. And this applies to our resident oral flora as, as well. And the sort of principles that apply is that the organisms that we naturally have that have evolved with us over millions of years is that they are far more competitive for sites at which they can attach. They can be much better at obtaining essential nutrients, and these are usually de um, derived from the host. So the organisms that the normal flora live off are those usually provided by the host. So, for example, in saliva, there are proteins and glycoproteins that the normal flora live from. They create microenvironments that are disadvantageous to exogenous species, and they can also produce inhibitory substances that will, again, um, discourage these transient organisms from establishing. And something that, that's happening currently is trying to understand how the body can recognize and tolerate these massive numbers of commensal organisms. As I say, nine out, out of 10 cells, nine are microbial and one is mammalian. How they can recognize these organisms and not react negatively against them um, and yet still respond to pathogens when we need them. So people have looked, for example, at the gut, where there are huge numbers of microorganisms lining the gut, and shown that when organisms attach to the surfaces of the epithelial cells lining the gut, you get you know, transcription of pro-inflammatory genes, so that you will tend to get an inflammatory response, very undesirable in the gut. What's coming through now in a series of studies is that there is possibly crosstalk between our commensal organisms and the host, which is saying, I'm really good for you, don't respond uh, to me. And this process down-regulates this pro-inflammatory response while retaining the ability to recognize a true pathogen and then being able to give an appropriate immune response. And a paper that's um, in press in infection in immunity is available um, electronically from the site, but isn't in hard copy yet. Uh, it's been done by a colleague of mine at Leeds, Deirdre Devine, and uh, colleagues in Canada um, that has shown that Streptococcus salivaris, which is a very common oral mucosal organism, can down-regulate the in innate immune responses in human epithelial cells. So we're now beginning to realize that it's not just we have a barrier of organisms, say, in our mouth or in our gut that um, wards off um, pathogenic organism, that it's actually a much more active and dynamic process. By having these natural organisms that have evolved with, with us, they're actually signaling to the host, and there is a dynamic relationship between the host and these org organisms. It leads to the uncomfortable conclusion that we may be more microbial than um, mammalian. So if you look at the uh, distribution of these organisms, as I say, every... Um, site in the body has microorganisms um, associated with, with them. And if you look at the types of microorganisms, which sad microbiologists like myself will sometimes do, there are differences in the organisms at each site, which means that the habitat can select. We swallow about a litre, litre and a half of saliva a day, um, and yet so saliva contains about 100 million bacteria per mil, and yet very few of those microorganisms, as they pass through the digestive tract, ever get established in the gut, yet they have every chance to do so. And that, you can only conclude, is because the environment in the gut is distinct, that it selects for a subpopulation of organisms. If we look in the mouth itself, there are distinct surfaces. There are obviously hard surfaces associated with teeth, mucosal surfaces. And again, if you look carefully enough and identify the bacteria to a sufficient level of discrimination, there are differences in the predominant types of organism. So we find organisms like the mutans streptococci more commonly on teeth um, than on the mucosal surfaces. Again, even though they get uh, present in saliva and could theoretically colonize all the surfaces. So again, we see that properties of the habitat, even within the mouth, can select for certain types of organisms. And if we look further and in more detail on the tooth surface itself, and here I've just distinguished Fisher plaque from gingival crevice plaque, you find 
substantial differences in the microorganisms. So, for example, in Fisher plaque, it's mainly gram-positive bacteria, such as streptococci. You find very few gram-negative organisms, whereas if we look in the gingival crevice, we find the, it's a predominant site for the obligately anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that use proteins uh, for their nutrition, whereas these tend to use sugars for their nutritional sources. And this, again, reflects differences in the environment. It's the only conclusion you can come to, that a change in the environment here means that some organisms will do better and others will do worse. And if we look at the site, we can see there are differences in pH. This is much more saliva-influenced, whereas here in the gingival crevice, and I apologize for the people on this side of the room, um, we have gingival crevicular fluid that bathes this area. And apart from bringing in components of the host dis defenses, um, based on uh, more, it's a serum-like exudate, so uh, IgG and neutrophils, it also brings in a range of different proteins and glycoproteins that happen to be wonderful substrates for some of the organisms we associate with periodontal disease. So the anaerobes love this environment. We provide just the sort of food that they love to grow. So we can conclude that, again, the microhabitat selects. Because these organisms have every chance to colonize every site, but they're localized. So we can conclude at this point that the habitat selects which organisms are best able to grow there. Habitat is also hostile. Not every organism can grow in every site. And so there is a direct relationship between the environment and the organisms that grow. And this is true of the mouth, the gut, and the rivers and streams outside. Now we're going to get a bit heavy for a while because we're going to talk about dental plaque. And this is sort of some slides that reflect our current understanding of the complexity of it. So the definition of dental plaque that I use is that it's a community of microorganisms found on the tooth surface. And organisms on any surface, and that's where they're normally found in nature, are now referred to as a biofilm. It doesn't mean that plaque has suddenly changed in any way when we use the term biofilm, and you'll see it in all sorts of uh, context. It means you're more likely to get funding money if you use the word biofilm. <laughs> and it also means we can extrapolate about things that are happening in the mouth. Because the principles that apply to a biofilm in a cooling tower, in a catheter-associated infection, or on teeth, could be broadly similar. So it does have advantages considering it as a biofilm because of this ability to utilize information from other sources. So it's a community of organisms embedded uh, in a matrix of polymers as a biofilm. And these polymers come from both saliva, so they come from the host, and they're also from the bacteria that them, themselves. The significance of this word community, which is often not used about dental plaque, it wouldn't matter if the properties of the organisms in dental plaque were merely the sum of all the individual cells. And that being a biofilm, <coughs> the properties were the same when they're on the surface as when they're free living in solution. The importance of these two words is that when these organisms are together as a community, you get more than the sum of the properties of the individual organisms. They can do things that they can't do individually. It's a bit like this group of people here. You can achieve things that perhaps would be more difficult for you to do as an individual person, but collectively you can influence and achieve um, additional benefits. Likewise, it's now known that organisms, when they attach to a surface, change their, their properties. So they downregulate certain genes and upregulate others to allow them to be successful in their new environment. So these are two important words. And I also wish to stress, as I said in my introduction, the plaque is natural, normal, and has benefits for the host. You will never eliminate it and should never even try. What you want to do is to control it and keep it at levels that are compatible with health. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about biofilms. They're ubiquitous. It's the natural place where microorganisms live. They generally rarely live 
in liquid suspension. Although you can find them there, it's usually because they've been washed off a surface. They can act as a haven for pathogens. So many um, overt pathogens can survive within the complexity of a biofilm because they hide from the host defenses. And as it as says here, they have altered microbial properties. So this is the biofilm in a water distribution pipe. Uh, this is, these are biofilms that have been lifted from machinery. So a problem with a lot of machinery is that they eventually slow down, grinds or halts because microorganisms get in the oil, the cooling systems, and they just love the surfaces. They grow on there and eventually the thing fails. Any people wearing contact lenses today? <laughs> microorganisms like contact lenses. Um, these are hip uh, replacement joints, and again, a big fear with putting any implant into a person is that microorganisms will attach to those, grow, and set up a chronic infection. Here's the contact lenses. Biofilms can establish on contact lenses, and obviously that's less desirable to put in contact with your eye than a nice clean lens. Legionella hides in the biofilms in hot water systems, and then we have plaque itself. And again, I stress that just because plaque is now called a biofilm hasn't changed what plaque is. But it does mean we can understand from events that occur across the whole of medicine and microbiology about what we may uh, know about dental plaque itself. We can apply that knowledge. So we begin to learn over the last five years or so a lot more about dental plaque biofilms through the application of new techniques, new imaging techniques, and so on. So in imaging, big step forward for studying biofilms has been the application of novel microscopy techniques such as confocal microscopy. In the past, we've used electron microscopy that shows biofilms to be a very compacted, dense film. Um, what I'll show on some slides is that when you have uh, confocal microscopy, you can view biofilms in their natural liquid state. So they're still covered in liquid. The processing for electron microscopy means they have to be dried down and, and the biofilms compress. And there's a lot more space and movement for molecules uh, within biofilms when, when you view them in their natural state. It's now possible to use uh, molecular techniques to identify and recognize, detect even the most fastidious of microorganisms. So organisms that we can't grow, we can now recognize they're there and they're probably doing something. Just because we can't grow them doesn't mean they're not important. People are now beginning to recognize that there may be virulent clones of certain periodontal pathogens. So some in uh, what used to be called juvenile periodontitis, there does appear to be a very pathogenic clone of an organism that has the nickname AA that comes from northwest Africa and has spread into other countries and seems to increase the risk of having very aggressive periodontal disease in adolescence by sort of 15, 18 uh, times. And again, um, now that uh, genomes are being sequenced of some of the oral organisms, we can begin to understand more about what they're doing when they're living on teeth, when they're causing disease, or being treated by antimicrobial agents. I'm going to go through some of the stages in how these uh, dental plaque biofilms form. Uh, these stages I'll go through one to seven um, fairly quickly, but I would just say that they're more for convenience, and in reality these phases are constantly happening. You don't have to get finished stage three before stage four happens. It just makes it easier for me to subdivide and explain. So if you clean a tooth surface, within seconds you get components from saliva being absorbed onto the surface called the acquired pellicle. Microorganisms are transported passively by the flow of saliva towards the surface where they can be held reversibly by weak long-range um, van der Waals forces. This can become more uh, strong by an irreversible by specific short-range forces between molecules on the cell surface and complementary receptors in the pellicle. And then as these organisms begin to grow, we call them primary colonizers, secondary colonizers that are unable to attach to the pellicle can sometimes uh, 
attach, again, through uh, specific receptors on the primary organisms and uh, adhesins on the secondary cock colonizers, that they can attach in specific ways, often through lectin-like interactions, in other words, carbohydrate-binding proteins, to those primary colonizers. People are beginning to uh, dissect out these adhesin receptor interactions. And the importance of this is that it could be helpful to develop um, analogs that block these very specific interactions and stop certain organisms attaching in such high numbers. So here we have some of the organisms, mainly streptococci at the start, and they attach to specific molecules in the pellicle. As plaque develops and matures, great big pointy thing comes down, Fusobacterium nucleatum, that has the advantage of binding to these primary colonizers, but acting um, as a source of attachment to some of the more anaerobic organisms that you associate with periodontal disease. So this is considered to be a, a significant organism in the development and maturation of dental plaque. So it builds up into a three-dimensional film. The organisms are in close contact with one another so they can interact metabolically. They start to modify the environment. So you can pick out of dental plaque organisms that are so fastidious in either their growth requirements or their sensitivity to oxygen that even in the best lab in the world, we can't grow them. We can detect them through the molecular techniques. So they're modifying the environment so it suits them. And within it, you get gradients and they synthesize polymers to make this a very sticky, difficult to remove um, biofilm, and also to help ward out molecules that we might try and apply to um, influence them. We now know as well over the last few years that these organisms don't just interact metabolically through chemicals, they can signal to one another and say, hey, I'm here, I'm next to you, we should start to do some trouble. So, you know, you get gangs of these organisms that can start to signal to one another, say there's enough of us now to cause mischief. So, again, people are trying to understand these signaling mechanisms. Um, this isn't just unique to dental plaque. It applies to um, most biofilm infections. Because if you can understand the language the organisms are using, you can perhaps tell them a lie and tell them to detach because the conditions aren't so good. So, in cystic fibrosis... Uh, the organisms in the lung form biofilms, they make different signaling mo molecules, but as a therapeutic, people are looking to see if they can give them the signal that says, this isn't a very nice place to be, you want to move on somewhere where, where else, and stop them forming biofilms. So again, you know, this is the way you understand how things happen when, when you study biofilms in different circumstances. The, in, the sort of standard biochemical interactions in plaque biofilms can include the development of food chains and food webs. Bacteria share enzymes, so if a substrate comes along that they want to use and they can't do it, they'll combine with a friend and say, you've got this enzyme, let's work together and make this happen. This is what I'm saying about the community effect. This is a community uh, process. They signal, they can combine to inhibit inhibitors, including antibiotics, and they can transfer genes. So if you look at this food chain, food web concept, many organisms will convert dietary carbohydrates to lactate and to other um, fermentation products. But these can also be consumed by other organisms. So, for example, classic one is Bilinella, a gram-negative coccus. It can't utilize carbohydrates directly. It doesn't have the right enzymes. It lives on lactate. So you get these food chains where lactate actually doesn't exist for very long if you have lots of velanella nearby. It gets converted to acetate. And other bacteria in these complex communities can, in fact, take these molecules down and convert them even further. So you get these mutual interdependencies, very complex, very highly developed and unevolved. So here we have our biofilm again. Here we have a cell that produces one of these signaling mo molecules. It's picked up by a neighboring cell that sits similar. It says, hello, there's a friend out there. So we have drug taking going on right under our noses, literally. In streptococci, these are through peptides, for example, called competent stimulating peptide, because the recipient cell, as a byproduct of this process, 
is more able to take up DNA. So if the plaque is under attack, cells are lysing, when these signaling molecules go out, they're also able to take up DNA much more effectively. And in the gram-negative anaerobes, they use uh, a different set of molecules. So as I said, they can take up uh, DNA, and this for microorganisms is the closest they get to sex. So apart from drug taking, you've also got sex. For all I know, rock and roll is going on <laughs> there as well. But these do offer new opportunities for control. And as time goes by, you know, these will be explored. People will be looking to see if they can interfere with these processes. At the same time, there are bullies in dental plaque as well. And these will be trying to force their way against competitors. So they can produce uh, small molecules called bactericins, hydrogen peroxide, acids, and compete for food. So there is warfare going on uh, under there all the time and violence. It's a nasty place to be. Organisms can sense their environment. They're very sophisticated. And if conditions become extreme in any way, they can sense these and detach. And they do this. Uh, some can produce proteases, enzymes that degrade their adhesin molecule. And so they attach and disappear. So in dental plaque, as I say, uh, we've normally looked at it through the electron microscope. And it looks a very d dense and compacted structure. And we've, interpreta we've interpreted this dense packing uh, to explain some of the properties of how molecules penetrate or don't penetrate into the biofilm. We've assumed that there are gradients, fairly linear gradients, within the biofilm. So for example, in, in, with food, they'll be more on the outside and getting less as you go down to the depths of the biofilm. And likewise, for oxygen, or this is a, a measure of how anaerobic um, a site is, the redox potential, that there's more oxygen on the outside and it's more anaerobic, uh, and more suitable for anaerobic organisms down in the depths. And correspondingly, metabolic products tend to accumulate in the depths of um, the biofilm, and you get less near the surface. If we look at uh, pH in dental plaque bi biofilms, the normal source of food for oral microorganisms is the host-derived uh, compounds. For example, in the mucins, there are proteins and glycoproteins. Uh, they can use the sugars off the mucin backbone. And what we get is a very slow rate of acid production, because it's not so easy to get these things off. It's not so easy to metabolize them. And we only get a small fall in pH. And isn't that just how we would like it? We keep the organisms there. They don't make much acid. We're all very happy. But as we've evolved as um, humans, we've developed this sweet taste. We like to have lots of sucrose. And when we lump that on top of the endogenous substrates, we get very rapid acid production. And we can get terminal pHs within a couple of minutes that are capable of demineralizing the enamel. If we look below the gum line, the organisms there can metabolize the gingival crevicular fluid. And it tends to go in the opposite direction. So the organisms that you find uh, in the subgingival environment are proteolytic. They don't tend to handle sugars. They like the proteins. And they tend to, uh, when they metabolize them, they produce ammonia and other compounds. And the pH tends to rise. However, as we're applying more and more sophisticated techniques, and this is a very complex microscopy technique that I was involved with. I'm not even sure I can say it. It would be embarrassing if I don't know what it is. It's two-photon excitation microscopy combined with fluorescent lifetime imaging microscopy. And in simple terms, people point a laser at a biofilm, and they flood it with a dye that is sensitive to pH. Its fluorescence is proportional to the pH of the site. And you can see here there is a grayscale, and the lighter colors are low pH, and the darker colors are a higher pH. And this was a laboratory-generated biofilm, mixed culture, nine, 10 organisms. And what we found was, instead of having this linear gradient, the organisms create little microzones of pH that can be very close to one another, just a few cell distances apart. So they create um, their own habitat, which probably explains why we get, in a small sample of dental plaque organisms, that on 
uh, paper, if they've read the papers and looked at the textbook, they shouldn't be existing together. They should be incompatible. We have anaerobes in a clearly aerated environment. And that's because within the biofilm, the properties of the biofilm, organisms consume oxygen near the surface, and very rapidly you get anaerobic conditions. They alter the pH, either making acid, producing alkali, which creates their own little niche. I guess it means when you go poking around with those little sharp sticks of yours, you know, you're doing quite a bit of damage to that um, exquisite architecture. Again, applying these confocal microscopy techniques, this is to a sample of plaque that was generated on a removable enamel device in human volunteers that we begin to see, although it's probably not as convincing as some of the cartoons you see in papers, but there are channels. Instead of it being a very dense, compacted structure, there are channels and spaces that uh, generate within these um, biofilms. The area that is quite frightening, and if any one of you have a nervous disposition or need to take medication for heart problem, this is the time, because in terms of knowing what's in dental plaque, I don't know when any of you were taught and may have learned what organisms are there. It's changing very rapidly and very quickly. In the olden days, when I started, we used to take some Petri dishes with some food in them that all the bugs would, would grow. We'd have some that would grow, we thought, everything, and some that were selective for only certain subtypes, we put them in a couple of atmospheric conditions and incubate them for a while, and we'd get the colonies coming on the plate, and then we'd pick them off, ram stain them, do a few simple tests. And a couple of weeks later, we'd know what we'd got. And even when we got quite sophisticated, you know, we could come up with a fairly formidable list. These wouldn't be in every sample of plaque, but if you looked at enough samples of plaque from different people, different sites, this is what we'd say you would could find in dental plaque at any time. These are what are called bacterial genera, the genus, and that genus is like a family name. So one of those could be the equivalent of marsh. If you look more closely, you could find within them, most of them have many species. So there could be a Philip Marsh, a Jonathan Marsh, uh, what are the other children I've got, a Catherine Marsh, a Thomas Marsh. Same with some of these. There are lots of different streptococci buried below that. Now we're using, it's possible, and again, this is applies to all biofilms, not just dental biofilms, molecular techniques where you can extract the D DNA, you can amplify um, certain genes uh, with universal primers, you can sequence, look for homology of these sequences in international databases, and suddenly you're realizing there's a whole different, it's like the Amazon in there in terms of the numbers of, of microorganisms. The benefit is you can generate probes from what you learn and apply those in fairly simple te techniques. And I know a lot of you are sports people, so you can go fishing in dental plaque for certain organisms. That's fluorescent in situ hybridization. Uh, no flies needed or anything. And you can look for certain organisms. And this is really becoming very challenging. It's recognized that at least half the organisms in plaque can't be cultured even in the best laboratories in the world. If we just take one group, the spirochetes, we're always talking about spirochetes and periodontal disease. We can grow some of them now, I think we're very clever, but when these techniques were applied, in one study alone, they found 47 species using molecular techniques that they can't grow. Are they important? Are they the critical ones? Or are they just bystanders? We don't know. And there's another group called the TM7, again found in subgingival plaque, it doesn't even have a name. It's supposed to go R ah, at this point. So we've got a group of organisms, which is called the TM7 clade. And again, it's found more commonly in sites with inflammation. Are they causing it? Are they responding to the inflammation and growing up because inflammation provides them with nutritional sources? We don't know yet. This is still a very dynamic, changing field. So. Perhaps if you're on the West Coast in a few years, there might be a chance just to update. So this is the type of list we have now. This is horrific, isn't it? Because again, these are the genus names, and behind a lot of these organisms, there are many species. What do we do with it? Is this helpful? So I said at the beginning, with microbiologists, look, what's wrong with you? We've given you all this information. Why don't you go and cure or prevent the disease? These are the organisms that somehow must be causing the disease. 
Why are you unable to apply this? It's very complicated, but we can simplify it. And I want to just show these couple of pictures because I thought they were quite um, instructive. This is looking at samples of plaque where you use a live dead stain. You can um, pick out or certain organisms. In fact, this isn't a live dead stain. This is showing that the uncultured spirochetes using one of those probes are red. And it's not like some of these organisms are just the occasional rare chance occurrence. These can be quite numerous in these samples. And it could be that we're just not detecting the critical organisms. And this is that TM7 organism shown in blue, and it's uh, exquisite looking organism. You can't help but love the things, can, can you, and want to study them. But the big thing that I would say is that it's, it's absolutely of no help to people to have all these names. I mean, what does it matter, or does it matter if someone's got centipede or something or other? We don't know yet. What we need to know is what these organisms are doing, what their function is, what do they indicate? If you detect this organism, does that mean there is a certain set of events happening? And so we're going to have to understand a lot more about what the organisms do and not worry too much about lists of, uh, of organisms. The other important thing about biofilms that um, you need to be aware of, and again, learning from the general biofilm environment, is that biofilms are much more tolerant of antimicrobial agents than the same organisms growing in conventional liquid or planktonic uh, culture. So if you apply an antimicrobial agent, it often won't penetrate all the way within the biofilm because the organisms produce these slimes, these, this matrix, and some antibiotics will bind to the slime and won't reach, they'll have an effect on the surface, but won't reach the organisms below. The organisms, when they start to detect the presence of an antimicrobial agent, can often induce a stress response. And so they'll upregulate genes that might help them to pump out the antimicrobial agent. Down in the depths of the biofilms, the environment is different. And that might be less conducive to the action of an antimicrobial agent. And there's also possibly a phenomenon of persister cells that have been genetically predetermined to be a subpopulation of the group of organisms, but are designed to be there when nuclear fallout has happened. They will survive and recolonize and take over the world. The bacteria also grow slowly in biofilms, and slow-growing organisms are more tolerant of antimicrobial agents, and they can also swap genes. So if we just look at some examples, here are in laboratory MOP models. Here is an organism associated with health, one periodontal disease. If you look at when they're growing as a biofilm, it can be many-fold more levels of the drug are needed to kill the organisms when they're growing as a biofilm than when they're growing simply in a liquid medium. The MIC is the minimum inhibitory concentration that stops growth. MBC is minimum bactericidal concentration that actually kills the organism. So data that you get from studies on liquid culture do not translate to when you're trying to treat biofilms. And this has led people to suggest we should be determining either the biofilm inhibitory concentration or the biofilm killing concentration or even the biofilm eradicating concentration. And if you look at data that has been done for strep sobrinus, it's implicated in caries, for two dental relevant products, you can see that the biofilm killing concentration was many fold more than what had been calculated on pre living bacteria that how these tests are normally done. It doesn't mean that these antimicrobial agents have no effect in the mouth, but if you're predicting that they're going to be killing or eliminating an organism, they won't. They will knock them back, but they won't remove all the organisms. And if we just look at a study where people grew some plaque in the mouth, so this is the surface on which they were growing and had been inserted into the mouth. We get this nice big biofilm. Here we have a green stain that shows live bacteria and a red stain that shows there are some red ones in there, dead. When you apply chlorhexidine, you can see the main effect of the chlorhexidine is on the surface of the biofilm. So it's not going to eliminate the biofilm, and that's probably not necessarily a bad thing, um, but it will have some effect on it. Also, uh, beware, particularly in relation to subgingival plaque, that there are many sites where some of the organisms in the plaque produce beta-lactamase, and they can be at concentrations that are sufficient to inactivate the penicillins 
in gingival cravicular fluid. So they may not be the organisms you think you're targeting. They may be sensitive, but there may be another organism nearby that's of no relevance to any periodontal disease, but they're making the enzyme, and they will neutralize and inactivate the antibiotic. Because this is a community. Yeah? It's, it's a risk, but I'm not sure I've seen much evidence for that. I think one always has to be very careful with antimicrobial agents, and often in dentistry we're using molecules um, that are more of a disinfectant nature, and they will tend to be uh, damaging bacteria in a fairly crude way, and the organism is less able to become resistant to it. But certainly if anyone is using antibiotics, one has to be very cautious because what the next few slides show is that you can get transfer of antibiotic resistance genes, in this case penicillin binding protein, from an oral commensal to a pathogen. Strep pneumoniae can exist in the throat and the pharynx and the mouth. And genes have been shown uh, to be passed from this organism to that, and in fact from the pathogen back to the commensal. So, the potential is there for reservoirs of resistance genes to accumulate. And even if it doesn't affect your dental treatment, it could be passed on to other organisms that could be more significant. And just to let you know, this is more sex happening. So again, just to finish off this, this section, I've emphasized that plaque is not only a biofilm but a microbial community. And it means they can live in a broader range of habitats. So we consistently find obligate anaerobic organisms in a hugely aerobic habitat. They can use food that individually they can't metabolize. They work together. Increased tolerance to inhibitors, as I've just shown by beta-lactamases, and indeed um, some organisms that are very weakly pathogenic, if they combine forces in a gang, they can cause disease. So abscesses are typically polymicrobial because each individual organism is not very pathogenic, but together they can form quite a violent group of individuals. So here we have our plaque. It's a biofilm. So we get altered gene expression. It's spatially organized. It's embedded in a slime, and they can talk to one another. As a community, there's lots of different organisms. They can grow in places we don't predict them to grow and uh, they have a more efficient metabolism, and they can be more virulent. And the consequences of all of this is that the plaque has a different phenotype than what we might predict. They coordinate their activities, they're functionally organized, and they're more resistant to the treatments we might think they ought to be susceptible to. However, over time, what we get is organisms growing on our teeth, and we get a balance. They reach a level They've gone through coaggregation and so on, and we get a reasonable level of balance. And this is despite some modest stresses. So despite the presence of the host defenses, as I've said, there seems to be some sort of uh, recognition of one another with a reasonable, sensible diet, although I couldn't define what that is. Despite age, I can't remember why I've got that on there, probably having an age moment, and despite the presence of exogenous <laughs> species, in general, over time, at a reasonable level of measuring what the organisms are, it'll remain pretty stable, pretty constant over time. And that, the important thing I want to stress here is that that's not due to any indifference by the organisms. They've just not got in there, it's like a retirement home, they're sat there, wow, this is really nice, you know, I get a bit of saliva, a bit of food, this is really comfortable. These organisms will respond to any change. If you're immune suppressed, they will detect that and respond. If you alter your diet, they will respond. So this stability is due to the fact that there are a lot of interactions between these organisms. They're dependent on one, on one another for um, breaking down the nutrition, for coping with the host defenses. So gen generally, one organism finds it very hard to break away and dominate under normal situations. So what that, that means is that we get this balance, D and remineralization and equilibrium, the little bit of acid they make is compensated for by remineralization, 
There's very little inflammation and very little production of gingival cravicular fluid. If you have a reasonable level of oral hygiene and a sensible diet, whatever that is. However, in people like me that don't have a sensible diet, useless at cleaning my teeth, I've kept dentists in yachts um, <laughs> for a long time, better holidays than I have, because you get caries, you get demineralization, exceeds remineralization, and you get inflammation and periodontal disease. So what we're having here is something has to have happened to alter this balance. So you get an overload by some environmental factor that suddenly disrupts this, and we get the ecological catastrophe and a rearrangement of the structure of that microbial community, which means you can get outgrowth of previously minor components of what's there. This is what we see in rivers and lakes when we chuck in nitrogen or phosphate fertilizers. This is what we perhaps see in acne um, when people have hormones that feed the bacteria on the skin, or in colitis. Does this happen in dental diseases? If we look at dental plaque in health, and it's there, you can find a certain nice consortium of microorganisms that we all have. They will be found in all of us. However, when we get caries, we get a shift. That's not the picture we see. We get much higher levels of acid-producing and acid-tolerating organisms like the mutans streptococci and lactobacilli. The properties that these organisms seem to share in common is the ability to produce acid from dietary carbohydrates most importantly, the ability to tolerate the acid they make. Because many organisms in plaque can make acid, but few of them actually like it when they've done it. I was going to say it's like me and drink, but perhaps that's not a good metaphor. And they produce extracellular and intracellular polysaccharides from sucrose. In periodontal diseases, we get a different flora. The flora seems to shift in a totally different direction. And we get increased numbers of gram-negative anaerobes. Nasty names, Porphyromonas gingivalis. It's so now not Actinobacillus, Actinomycetum comitans, it's Agrigacibacteria, Actinomycetum comitans. We get spirochetes, we get Tanarella, and the unculturables. And they seem to be associated with the production of proteases that can degrade the host compounds in uh, the crevice, cytotoxins that'll damage the host cells there. They induce an inflammatory response. But the trick is, the inflammatory response is supposed to be helpful to us to control the organisms. But what some of these organisms do with their proteases is they actually break down the immune modulators, the backup defense that the host has to dampen the inflammatory response gets broken down. So you get an uncontrolled, uh, inappropriate inflammatory response. And that in itself causes bystander damage to the tissues. So the thing is, you know, if you're a microbiologist, and you haven't got a nice yacht, and you're not going on a golfing holiday, you lie awake at night and you wonder, why? Well, not why am I have not got a yacht, but why does this happen? How does it happen? And what can you do to stop it and reverse it? Now, one of the key questions is where do these pathogens come from? Because when you're old like I am, you've seen various things come and possibly go. One thing was whether dental diseases, and this was a reasonable question, could be regarded as exogenous diseases. You acquired the organism from someone, and then you established an infection, just like many other diseases. And certainly in the early days, if you try to look for some of these periodontal organisms with the limits of culture that we had, it was very difficult to detect them. But now we have molecular techniques like PCR, where you amplify small bits of DNA, and the key word is amplify, so even if they're there at very low levels, you can detect them. And this is checkerboard, another uh, molecular system for detecting organisms without growing them. People have found that actually many of these organisms that have been implicated in disease are there in health. Now, it might mean that these people would subsequently go down with disease at some time in, in the future, because these are kind of cross-sectional studies, or you could interpret the fact that these organisms are present naturally most of the time, but at levels that are so low that they're not clinically relevant. You can get transmission 
certainly from mother to child with the new time streptococci, and between spouses for some of the periodontal organisms, which I think is a business opportunity for me, because when someone lines up a partner, perhaps I could check their periodontal pathogens for them before they engage in anything where they might be transferring organisms between one another. If anyone wants to talk to me about that, I can be found later. So, to my mind, this is where we simplify things down. Very complex, we've got loads of organisms there. But if we think back to health, we know these organisms are present. And if we look at health here, the green ones are what we have naturally and are giving us benefit. One situation is that we have very low levels, shown in red there, of the organisms that we might implicate in disease. So they're there already, but at levels that are so low that they're not clinically relevant. It's like carriage of an organism. It could be they're not there at all, that's one theory, and we acquire them, so they're transmitted to us. But in either case, for disease to occur, where we know when we take samples of plaque from disease sites, you get elevated levels of these nasty red organisms. For that to happen, they've got to outcompete the green organisms. And that shouldn't happen from ecological principles. And the only way that can happen is for some change, some major ecological pressure that suddenly alters the competitiveness of these organisms. And the most likely changes are a change in the diet, an increase in inflammation at the site, a reduction in the host defenses, and a change in local pH. So what, therefore, we need to do is to interfere with those changes and push the system back in the opposite direction. So I'm now going to just go through very quickly um, the dynamic relationship between the environment and bacteria. So we know from looking at microbial consortia that are in ponds, in the gut, uh, in the mouth, that the sort of factors that determine whether you change the floor or not are like how much, what, do you get different food there? Because there are organisms that require certain different food. If the pH changes, or if there's a change in the status of the host response, or whether it becomes more anaerobic. So the key one in, in the mouth is obviously, do we get more sh fermentable sugars in the diet more regularly? Because that will also change the pH. And in caries, we get an acid stress. We get low pH in plaque. A lot of the organisms are not going to like that. Subgingerly, we get a small rise in pH. So it can become alkaline there. And again, that will favor the growth of some organisms particularly when they're metabolizing gingival crevicular fluid. It's obviously a problem if your host defenses are um, compromised, whether it's uh, through neutrophil defects or a reduction in saliva flow, and that can occur through all sorts of factors like taking medication for an unrelated problem. And likewise, when plaque builds up, it can get very anaerobic, and that can encourage the growth of some of the anaerobic pathogens. Bacteria are what's known as plastic. They will respond. They're not made of plastic, but they are plastic in terms of their response. They are not constant in what genes they express or what properties they exhibit. So when the environment changes, they shift their gene expression and their properties accordingly. So if we grow an organism in pure culture and look at the effect of pH or, or, or sugar, we can measure properties like, oh, you get more acid production, less acid production, more proteases, less proteases. And we initially spent a lot of time trying to explore this. And we use a system called a chemostat. This is again used in general microbiology. You grow your bacteria in a vessel, but you can control the conditions, whether it's temperature, pH, oxygen, and the composition of the media. And it's a very precise. You can grow the organisms indefinitely under a standard set of conditions and say, under this set of conditions, the organism does this. If we change the amount of sugar there, they do that. And that's where we started from. So we know the environment changes during disease. We know that oral bacteria are capable of responding to these environmental changes. And we look to see at the sort of environmental changes we see in disease, how that affects the so-called pathogenic organisms. 
And summarizing a lot of information, we found that organisms that we associate with caries, like mutans, streptococci, and lactobacilli, grow better at low pH and under high sugar. They make more acid, particularly more lactic acid, and their growth is actually optimum uh, below 7. In contrast, if you take a periodontal organism like Porphyromonas gingivalis, it upregulates its proteases at alkaline conditions. And when there's lots of hemin, it needs hemin for growth. It binds hemin in the mouth from the breakdown of gingival cravicular fluid that has hemoglobin, haptoglobin, and other heme-containing molecules. And again, its growth optimum is more in the alkaline side of things. And under these conditions, under these disease-related conditions, we see upregulation in genes that are associated with virulence. So we studied, for example, um, organism implicated in caries, strep mutans, and compared it to organisms that are not, that are implicated in, in health. And we could show that there were differences. The, under certain conditions, like lots of sugar or at low pH, strep mutans did more, grew faster, made more acid. And likewise, when we took a periodontal organism and grew it when there was lots more heme in, which we predict to be the case in inflammation in the subgingival crevice, it upregulated some of its nasty proteases that can be very destructive to tissues and break down the host control proteins. Well, that was okay for a while, kept me in business for a while. But then the big jump was to say, but we're studying these organisms by definition, as Pasteur himself had done. I said I was old. I'm not that old. It was only by reading his work. You study organisms in isolation, because that's the only way you understand what that organism is capable of doing. But as I've stressed, plaque is a community of organisms, and now we're wiser we realize that the properties of a mixture of organisms can be different to just adding up the properties of the individuals. It's more than the sum. So we began to realize that something that happens to this organism may affect its relationship with that organism. So although it was contrary to dogma, we started to grow organisms together. So it's just not the thing you should do. Because then we could see the effect of a change in a key environmental <coughs> parameter on the competitiveness of the organisms and how that might affect the structure of the microbial community. We initially started with dental plaque, seemed obvious, but when we started to grow dental plaque as a mixture, it was just like studying patients where they have all these organisms. So we suddenly find organisms we didn't know were there in the first place. We didn't know where they'd come from. We couldn't replicate the study because uh, we couldn't manipulate the composition. So we decided to go to an in-between stage where we had nine or ten organisms that were either found in health or caries or perio and grew them together. So we knew they were there at the beginning. We chose them because we were lazy and we could easily identify them. They had some factor that allowed us to identify them. We could store these mixtures in a freezer and then we could bring them out in replicate experiments so we had good reproducibility. And we could take one out or put an extra one in if we had an environment... Uh, experimental question. The big trick was to use a medium to grow them in that reflected the habitat. So we used something that had mucin, glycoproteins, uh, in. Again, we used this chemostat device because we could grow the organisms indefinitely for weeks at a time under standard conditions, and then we could change one parameter at a time. We could change pH without changing growth rate without changing the concentration of sugars. So we could get true cause and effect relationships. We could introduce surfaces and develop slightly more complex systems, which I'll show you very quickly in some slides, but it's not really important for you to understand. So this is the sort of, sort of system we have. This is our chemostat. It's a vessel, grow bacteria in, and we can control most of the parameters and vary them independently. For some experiments, um, so we feed it with that medium, we could put this stuff into a second stage chemostat, an another one, and mess that one up without affecting this, because this takes a long time to do. And we could put surfaces in there so we could grow biofilms. And then for another application, we could feed that into a different biofilm device where we could grow biofilms of different depths, um, thin ones, thick ones, and so on. This is this 
biofilm death device. It looks like this. It's got a rotating turntable. Those that have long playing records would know what the significance of a turntable is. Uh, the biofilms grow in there, and you can recess little plugs in there to a particular depth. And so you can have them to any defined depth. These are the organisms. We've got some that are associated with health, caries, and periodontal disease. As I said, one of the first key steps was to grow it on mucin. And this is what a, a mucin molecule may look like. It has a protein backbone and then side chains with sugars on. For the organisms to use these sugars, and this is just a tip if you get reincarnated as an oral bacterium, it may be the only sugar you can use is galactose, but you can't get to it because there's a sialic acid on the end. You need to find someone who takes off that sialic acid. Okay, just free tip. So the organisms that we had, we selected, some had very little ability to break down these mucins, and others had very specific major uh, enzyme activities. So we put five of the ones that could do hardly anything together in this community, and they grew to that, these sort of numbers of organisms. Five of them together, that's their initials, doesn't really matter. We then added in the two bacteria that had sialidase. They will take off that sialic acid, and they grew up. And in fact, what this yellow means is very complicated to explain, is that the numbers of these organisms weren't very big, and they're hidden in between there as blue. But what the effect of adding in sialidase, it had a boost to those that were already there, because some of those wanted the galactose. So you get an increase in the ones that the five that were already there went up as shown by this yellow bar. Then we added in someone who could take off the fucose, the lactobacillus, and again, you can't see its numbers because it's hidden as a blue bar there. But it also had a bonus on those that were all already there, another boost with the yellow bar. And perhaps you'll see it here clearly. When we add in a big protease producer, you can see the numbers of the protease producer itself. But again, because that suddenly releases peptides and amino acids for the others, we get an increase in those that are already there in the yellow. In fact, when we added another organism, the tenth, it had nothing new to offer, so nothing really um, happened. So these organisms are acting as a true community. They're interacting, they're dependent on, on one another, and that was important, because what they're doing, we add one organism, it takes off this, it takes off that, which means organism three can have a go. That means the protein is now available for organism four, and so on. The other thing is, how else are they functioning together as a community? And these organisms, uh, these are what are called facultatively anaerobic, the green ones. They can grow in the presence or absence of oxygen. The orange one is aerobic, likes oxygen, and the red are anaerobic. So we were growing this in a system where we weren't making it anaerobic. So in the inoculum, in the first stage of a two-stage vessel, the anaerobes dominate. The anaerobes are in charge, it's anaerobic conditions. The aerobe is barely detectable. And we fed this into a second vessel where we pumped in as much air as is possible, which is like my mouth at the moment. There's a lot of air going through it. And to our surprise, the anaerobes are still there. The aerobe um, became dominant because it's suddenly got all that oxygen that it needs for its metabolism. But somehow those anaerobes that shouldn't be growing in this situation are there. And even if we looked in the liquid environment, because we thought this might be a biofilm effect, same situation. But when we measured the amount of oxygen there, couldn't detect it, less than 1%, even though we're pumping in air as fast as a pump will pump. And in fact, this measure of anaerobiosis means it's very anaerobic. And we concluded that these are functioning as a true community. It's the aerobe, the Neisseria, that no one has hardly looked at at all, but it's found in all plaque samples, is consuming all the oxygen in that system, which means the anaerobes flourish. So we tricked the culture. We took out the Neisseria. So now we knew that the, the anaerobes wouldn't grow in an aerobic situation. But below us, down as microbiologists, the anaerobes were still there. And this time, it was the streptococci that were using the oxygen, not as effectively. We did get oxygen there. But it proved 
how smart you think you are. Anaerobes don't grow in the presence of oxygen. We all know that. They do when they grow as a community. And it just shows how these organisms in interact. We even tested that these were true anaerobes. We measured how long they could survive on their own in air, and it was in minutes. We thought perhaps that it's because they coaggregate with one another, and we put the anaerobe with the aerobe. No one had ever looked to look for coaggregation with an aerobic organism like the Neisseria. And the only evidence, this is a numerical score where four is a lot, and naught to one is hardly anything, um, was with the fusobacterium. And that fusobacterium will coaggregate with everything. So when we added the fusobacteria in, uh, we did see improved coaggregation. So we thought that perhaps in surviving the oxygen, the organisms are forming functional units. They're forming a consortium that can cope with this. So this is the Neisseria and an an anaerobe, and there's very small little aggregates there. When we added the fusobacterium in, we get these big consortia, big units, and our inference is in here. Um, there's very little oxygen. And this just shows that when we look at the numbers of these two anaerobic organisms, when the fusobacterium is there, we get substantial proportions of them. When it's not, we find hardly any. When we aerate, pump in oxygen into the community. So we were quite confident that our consortium could form a biofilm and it functioned as a true community. So now we go back to this. Why do we get these ships? We could set up a culture, sorry, where we have health and try and shift, find out the factors that would drive it towards caries or drive it towards periodontal disease. We know that caries are associated with lots of sugar and low pH and periodontal diseases with increases gingival cavicular fluid and rises in pH. So we ex explored those. So we took our experimental system with 10 species. And the design initially, this is a long time ago, young man, dark hair. Um, we pulsed in a fermentable sugar. We chose glucose for simplicity. Each day, once a day, because the kinetics of the system would be the glucose would be lost ready for the next day when we could add a fresh pulse. But we could exploit the unique capability of this system that we could keep the pH constant at neutral pH. And we could just see the effect of sugar per se. There is no other model system you can do this. If you add it to a human or an animal, as soon as you add in the sugar, the pH changes. You never work out whether it's pH or sugar that does this. And as the control, we added in the glucose and we let the pH find its own level through bacterial metabolism. So before we did the pulsing, what we found were high levels of the healthy bacteria, low levels of mutant streptococci, and low levels of the lactobacilli. They were less than 1% combined of the total flora. When we did the study with the glucose pulse, a constant pH 7, the flora was relatively unchanged. Even though there was fermentable sugar there, these organisms did not benefit from it. They stayed at less than 1% of the flora. However, when we changed the system and let the pH change following each glucose pulse, gradually over the 10 successive days, we got dominance by the mutant streptococci and the lactobacilli, and the healthy species were reduced. This is moderately good slide. I scanned this. <laughs> at home just before I came away. And I, at home, I've got a newer version of PowerPoint and I've got it work and I just could not get this to go. So I, of course, what I did, I got my son to do it for me. <laughs> That's when you know you're getting old. So this is from the original paper. And what we have here, it's not as clear as I would like it, but the squares if we look at this sanguinis, which is associated with health, an organism associated with health. The squares are where we pulse with glucose on 10 occasions. So this shows the 10 days. And this shows their viable count. But the pH is kept constant at pH 7. And this lower line 
with the cross is where there was no pH control, the culture of the 10 organisms, every time it saw the glucose could make however much acid it wanted for six hours, then we bring the pH back, leave it overnight, give it a pulse the next day. And you can see it tolerates the first few pulses. Then we get this oscillation. Each time it's pulsed, the pH went further, went lower, and it had more and more of a negative effect. These are the numbers, log numbers of bacteria. So by the end of the 10th pulse, it was almost uh, non-detectable. And this can be contrasted to strep mutans, which is implicated in caries, obviously. And again, the square is the case where it starts off and we've got uh, no pulsing. And as we pulse, but the pH is kept constant, it pretty much stays at the same number of cells. But when we do with the crosses, um, we have no pH control. It again gradually dominates within the culture. And if the, the bottom graph shows um, the amount of acid produced after each pulse, and that's the square, and you can see this is a log hydrogen ion concentration. After each pulse, we get more and more acid. We select a little bit of extra strep mutons, a little bit of lactobacilli. Next pulse comes in, they make even more acid. They grow up because they love low pH conditions. So the next pulse comes in, they make even more acid. And so this is the amount of acid they made. And this triangle is the time to reach an arbitrary pH 5. And again, the time reduces. The amount of acid made increases. The time they take to do it gets shorter. So we're getting a more and more catastrophic effect on the flora. And if we then went on to study this by stopping the experiment at a particular pH. So the bacteria could make acid, but we would only let them make so much. So we set up whole independent experiments where we'd let the pH go to 7, no change at all, or to 5.5, set up a totally new experiment, and it could go to 5, set up a totally new experiment, and the pH could go to 4.5, and this is what we had before the no pH control. And this is for two organisms that like acid acidic conditions, and you can see there is almost a dose response curve. This is the terminal, um, the results after the final uh, pulse, and you can see that the lower the pH, the greater the proportion of the strep mutans or lactobacilli in the culture. And if we look at two organisms that are very pH sensitive, you can see it goes in the opposite direction. And this was supported, or you could find evidence in the literature, this is Mona Svanberg from Sweden, something done in 1980, where she got patients, volunteers, to rinse with phosphate buffer of different pHs and just look for the percentage of mutant streptococci in plaque. And you can see that when you had two lots of rinsing with low pH buffer, you again selected out mutant streptococci in the plaque. So, the conclusions of this was it's the low pH rather than just sugar availability per se that selects for kerogenic bacteria. And there was a relationship. The lower the pH, the higher levels of kerogenic organisms. And again, it posed the question, could inhibitors of acid production prevent this selection? So we chose fluoride. At the time, you know, fluoride was obviously very recognized as a very important molecule, but people didn't really felt it had, could have any effect on the oral organisms because the MIC, the sensitivity for their growth of an organism at pH 7 uh, to fluoride means you'd have to have massive concentrations, which would ne never achieved in plaque in humans. But sublethal levels of fluoride interfere with enzymes within the bacteria, and certainly it was known in mutant streptococci Fluoride penetrated and affected these enzymes preferentially at low pH. So it was perfect. As the pH starts to fall, the fluoride goes in and inhibits the bacteria. So we chose, we did this in a number of different systems where we had moderately low levels of fluoride. People can argue whether these are realistic or not. So again, it was the same setup. We saw the effects of glucose pulsing, uh, let the pH change effects of glucose pulsing, let the pH change, but we added in fluoride. And what we saw, um, 
as before, if you don't let the pH change, uh, mutans, streptococci, lactobacilli don't respond. If you let the pH change, they get dominated by those organisms. If you add the fluoride, the flora is again relatively unchanged. The mutans, streptococci, and the lactobacilli are unable to exploit a set of conditions that you would think they would be able to. And if we look at the levels of best mutans, in this particular study, before we started the pulsing, there were 4% of the community of organisms. If we glucose pulsed without, uh, with fluoride, they got up to 23%. If we uh, had the fluoride there, they stayed at around 3% of the culture. And again, there was a difference in the pH. And again, you, you can see this with hydrogen ion concentration. With just glucose alone, uh, you get lots of protons produced. When you have the glucose plus fluoride, that ability to produce acid is retarded. And this is the time to reach pH 5. And again, when you've got fluoride there, you slow the rate of acid production. We did this more recently in biofilms, because that was done in planktonic cultures. And the biofilm people obviously say, well, it's because you've done it like that. And this is where we've taken a section in a biofilm developed in that constant depth film fermenter. And this time, we've moved on from with that pH system we had before, where instead of having a grayscale, we have a color scale uh, now, where um, pHs around neutrality are yellow and orange. pHs that are acidic are the hotter colors, red and through to blue. And this is time sequence in minutes, looking at the same section of the plaque biofilm at a particular depth within that. We don't know what those organisms are. It's a mixed culture of organisms. And you can see that as time goes by, with glucose alone, it gets hotter. We get more and more acid produced. And that can be converted into a normal pH 4 curve. When we do it with low levels of fluoride, the colors <coughs> stay much more in the yellow and light orange and uh, the pH fall isn't as far. And in fact, we got quite a substantial reduction in pH change in this artificial biofilm. So fluoride can have an antimicrobial effect because it can directly inhibit the bacterial enzymes associated with sugar metabolism and pH tolerance. It interferes at a number of levels, but it also has an indirect effect because if it's not making as much acid, if it's not changing the pH, it's taking away the most major competitive environmental factor that the mutant streptococci exploit. They grow up because the conditions get acidic. That's their optimum. That's what they like best. In the Olympics, they do best at acidic conditions. When it's not getting to those acidic conditions because of the direct inhibition effects, they're also unable to exploit the situation even with sugar present. So it works at two levels. What do you think the mechanism of fluoride? Well, it can inhibit enolase, which is in the glycolytic pathway uh, where sh glucose goes to be made to lactic acid. Um, it can also interfere. It brings, it goes in as HF. At low pH, the fluoride becomes HF, goes into the cell. The fluoride goes off and inhibits certain enzymes, but then there's protons inside which the organism doesn't like. It acidifies the inside, and the organism has to spend energy pumping out those protons. So it's sort of weakening the metabolism of the cell. So it can work at quite a number of subtle levels that accumulatively make strep mutans not like fluoride. You could never design a molecule like fluoride to do all these things. And we also looked at some sh sugar substitutes because at the time they were being proposed, and we found that, uh, that xylitol um, prevented the selection of uh, mutant streptococci. So when glucose was present, it reached around 20% of the flora. Curiously, when we had glucose plus sorbitol, it um, seemed to like that. <laughs> Um, but when we had glucose plus xylitol, it really didn't like the combination. At the time, the theory was xylitol goes into the cell, and again, the organism has to spend energy pumping that xylitol out, and that the xylitol goes into what's called a futile pathway that blocks 
the metabolism of the organism. Some people dispute this, but uh, we just did the experiment, and those were the results. So I said that low pH rather than carbohydrate availability selects for kerogenic bacteria. There's a relationship between how low the pH goes and high, how high we get kerogenic organisms, and that inhibitors of acid production can prevent selection of kerogenic bacteria. We've done a little bit of work on periodontal disease, interested again in gingival cravicular fluid as not only a source of the host defenses, but also as providing novel nutrients. And for these experiments, serum has been used as a surrogate for gingival cravicular fluid because we need quite a lot of it for these experimental systems. What had given us encouragement was, again, a study um, before some of you were born, I expect, um, done in the Netherlands where a Dutch group had taken samples of plaque from patients, three samples of plaque, in which they'd looked for an organism at that time was considered relatively important in periodontal disease, Prevotella intermedia. And in the, the sample of plaque, in two of them they couldn't detect it, ND is not detected, and in the third one it was less than 1% of the, the flora, so not really very important. They then did what's called enrichment cultures, where they would put the plaque in some serum for a few days, let it grow up, and then look for this tar target organism. And again, after one enrichment, they couldn't detect it. It was at low levels, couldn't detect it. By enrichment step two, they could detect quite a lot of it in the first sample, but not in the other two. They then put it into fresh serum, and in enrichment step three, it was detected in all three of them. And you can see, as they go on through the enrichments, you could suddenly detect the organism, and it reached quite high levels. This means that that organism was present, but at levels that were below the detection limit. You change the nutrient source, and suddenly it's a competitive organism. It's there in large numbers. It shows you can push the composition of the plaque flora just by changing key parameters. So we've done a study with our same community in our same very defined system, um, and we grew it in a medium 10 organisms there. It was highly anaerobic. That's a very, very low level of the redox potential. And the pH was around pH uh, 7, which is what you find in a healthy gingival crevice. When we measured protease activity, it was low. When we measured the numbers of porphyromonas gingivalis, it was low. At this point, we added in serum as a surrogate for gingival cravicular fluid, and then let the culture do what it wanted to. And what we found was the pH rose, and it went up to pH 7.5, which is the sort of pH you can find in inflamed periodontal pockets. It became even more anaerobic. The redox potential went lower. And the protease, protease activity went really high. And porphyromonas gingivalis became almost 80% of the composition of that community. So again, simply by changing the nutrient source, we distorted the composition of that community. We did another study where we grew just three organisms that are all called black pigmented anaerobes. They make a black pigment. They're very easy to see. Orphomonas gingivalis found in advanced periodontal disease. This may have a role. It's in the orange complex. This is found more in healthy plaque. These two pHs are what people might find in a healthy gingival crevice. And what we found when we grew these three organisms together, those two organisms, that, that organism was the predominant organism out of the three. We just shift the pH of that culture by a quarter of a unit, and suddenly Prevotella intermedia is more competitive, and we get significant levels of Porphyromonas gingivalis. We shift it another quarter of a unit, which is what can be found in inflamed pockets, and this now is dominating. It's far more competitive than the organism we have found with health. So again, we see that just changing uh, nutrient status, the pH, you can shift. These organs are very responsive, shift the composition of the flora. So we had these three uh, principles earlier. We can see that the relationship between the organisms and the environment is active and dyna dynamic, and it probably can be manipulated. So just finishing off, I don't know about you, but I'm just about parched. The 
theories that have been put forward to explain the relationship of plaque to disease for a long time were the specific plaque hypothesis put forward by one of the most distinguished oral microbiologists, Walter Lowish. And this was really very helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you. Because instead of looking at all the organisms that we know are in plaque and can see, and wondering, well, which one of them is it, from a series of studies, he said, well, strep mutans and strep sobrinus uh, are very clearly associated with uh, caries. We must focus on those. So that helped us to suddenly start to understand these organisms. There was a different view, perhaps coming more from U Europe, which was the nonspecific plaque hypothesis, and it was more applied to periodontal disease, which said, but all the organisms have some role. Some are bad for us, some are actually good for us, and it's the net outcome of all of those interactions that's important. So we should, um, we should concentrate and note all of, of the organisms. And sometimes, you know, we'd have whole conferences on, on this. Uh, people would almost be fighting as to which camp you, you, you fell in. And if the diseases weren't specific, they certainly showed evidence of specificity. When you look at disease sites, you certainly see certain groups of organisms consistently there. And I felt what was an important uh, factor missing was what selected for these organisms? Because I was coming to the conclusion at that time that they were there. Um, it was more an imbalance in what we had that led to disease. So to get that environmental factor in and to reconcile the sort of fairly subtle differences between both of those hypotheses, I put forward the ecological plaque hypothesis. And the benefits of it, I think, was that the etiology need not be monospecific. So many organisms could contribute. It didn't worry me that it wasn't just a single organism. You could carry the so-called pathogens. You know, it wasn't a problem that some people found when you started finding disease sites um, without the pathogen or healthy sites that had the pathogen. It's well known that you can carry these organisms. And none of the factors that we're talking about in disease are so specific. It's not like a specific toxin, um, Clostridium tetanus, that causes Clostridium tetani that causes tetanus produces a specific toxin. If you have that toxin, give it to a person, they'll suffer from tetanus. We're talking about acid production that a lot of the bacteria make. The key thing for me was that disease could be prevented or controlled, not only by directly inhibiting the causative organisms with all the approaches that were being put forward by the specific plaque hypothesis, but the key thing was you needed to interfere with the factors that were driving these deleterious shifts. Because if you didn't interfere with those driving factors, the patient would only come back in a few months' time with the disease again. You hadn't eliminated the problem. All you'd done was uh, dealt with it at that time. So in caries, what we got was if you took in sugar, acid was made. This causes a stress. The pH shifts from neutral to low pH. We get an environmental shift. And we get a shift from organisms like Sanguinis and Gordonii that we find in health to mutant streptococci and lactobacilli. So we get this ecological shift. And we will tend to push the system more towards health and caries. And my argument is, yes, you could deal with these organisms directly. But unless you interfere with the factors that are driving the emergence of these organisms, you won't be totally dealing with the problem. So what we have is that the environment is selecting bacteria with properties that are both acid producing and acid tolerating. And while these traits are associated with mutant streptococci, they're not uniquely so. So people have found other acid tolerating streps that are not in the mutant streptococci group. That's fine. It's no problem to me at all. And likewise, there are other streps that on their own can produce um, lots of acid uh, as much as mutant streptococci, well, of course, they'll be important. You know, we're not looking for a specific organism. And this is, is shown here because it's now recognized that not all mutant streptococci are equally acid tolerant and that several streptococcus species can uh, behave s similarly. It's just that those traits are most constantly focused with the mutant streptococci, but they're not exclusively so. And likewise, if you look at bacteria that can grow at low pH, um, 
quite now we know quite a few organisms can. It's not exquisitely associated with mutant streptococci. And again, that the velocity of acid production by some strains, a particular pHs, are equivalent or better than mutant streptococci. So a lot of organisms will play a role. So the way you could try and reduce the sugar flow or low pH challenge is obviously through fluoride, clearly through dietary control, reducing the frequency of providing them with fermentable uh, sugars, encouraging the use of products that have non-fermentable substrates in, sugar substitutes, stimulating where possible uh, saliva flow, and antimicrobial agents in dental products. Perhaps in Europe we have far more of, of these with met metal salts and triclosan. Even at sub-MIC le levels, these will um, interfere with sugar transport and acid production, even if they don't actually kill the organisms. And as I uh, have already alluded to, the use of uh, products that contain sweeteners that can't be metabolized by the oral flora will have benefit because they will stimulate saliva flow and all the benefits of saliva flow without leading to damaging amounts of acid. If we look at gingivitis, it's a bit more complicated, but when plaque accumulates, we get a stress, we get increased inflammation, that's going to cause an environmental change. We're going to get increases in gingival curricular fluid flow, we're going to get bleeding, a raised pH and temperature, and this will tend to drive a shift in the balance of the organisms. We'll shift from a gram-positive flora to greater numbers of gram-negative organisms and obligate anaerobes. And this will tend to push the system more towards gingivitis or periodontal disease and away from health. This system is selecting for those bacteria with properties that are proteolytic and like to grow under slightly alkaline conditions. And these traits, again, are associated with organisms that we commonly find there, like Porphyromonas gingivalis, uh, T4 scythia, and spirochetes, but not uniquely so. And again, the way one can try and alter the subgingival environment is with oxygenating or redox agents. People are looking at molecules that can shift the redox potential to make it less anaerobic, to make it less favorable to the growth of uh, anaerobic organisms, and to reduce inflammation and gingival curricular fluid flow. So people are beginning to develop different classes of uh, anti-inflammatory agents. And again, I should say that some antimicrobial agents like chlorhexidine, triclosan, metal salts, even when they're not killing the organisms, can often inhibit the proteases these organisms use to cause their, their damage. So much favored in dental communities is the seesaw or, or the balance. So it's just to remind us that this is a dynamic and active relationship, that the microbe, microbe interactions, host microbe interactions are delicately poised. And when they're poised appropriately, we get benefit and harmony from this relationship. At times, if we have an inappropriate diet, oral hygiene is rubbish, host defenses are suppressed, that just shifts the balance and we get uh, a problem with this host microbe interaction and disease occurs. And I think, therefore, which I am so impressed with this group, and it's been so uplifting for me to hear people talk, is this holistic approach to dental disease. Because it's absolutely true, I've spent my life looking at plaque, and so on, but see little translation of some of these ideas to um, dental disease. And if you go to conferences, you'll be talking about saliva, the answer is always saliva, or it's diet and lifestyle, or host defense people. Certainly microbiologists like to think they've got the answer. And really, really, all these are interconnected. Your diet affects the microflora. Your lifestyle can affect saliva flow, which again will affect the microflora and so on and so forth. So you need to take a far more holistic approach to understanding what may be going wrong. Is that the question? What where, where you bring things back from well, we haven't done that particularly, but I think that's what people are looking at and that's what they're saying they can do. So you could take someone where the conditions are inappropriate, perhaps they already have disease or they're susceptible to disease, and the feeling is you can apply specific approaches 
when you identify what it is is their particular risk factor and try and bring them back within the boundaries of what may be called normal. So just to finish off, you've been very patient. I try to emphasize that dental plaque is both a biofilm and a microbial community, that it's natural and beneficial to health. It does good things for us. But that the plaque bacteria respond to environmental changes and that the plaque-mediated diseases seem to be due to changes in the local environment, which can then enrich organisms that were only a minor component of the plaque consortium. And so if dental diseases aren't exactly ecological catastrophes, perhaps they're micro-ecological catastrophes. And I think the ecological concept does offer novel therapeutic possibilities, and particularly also educational and communication opportunities. People are very aware of the impact of the environment on their lifestyle, and you can translate that down to events that are occurring in their own man. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hope I haven't gone on too long, and I'm here for the whole conference, so if people want to talk to me about things, I'm more than happy to do so. Thank you very much.